Fernando Arenares. Fernando Arenares is a professor of political science and security studies at Universitat Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid. He also teaches postgraduate courses on terrorism and anti-terrorism at Ortega y Gasset University Institute, General Gutierrez Melado University Institute, and Instituto de Empresa. Previously, he was senior Fulbright scholar and lecturer in political science at Stanford, fellow of St. Anthony's College in Oxford, titular professor of sociology as well as holder of a Jean Monnet chair in European studies at UNED, and a professor of government at the University of Burgos. He is a member of the Council on Global Terrorism and the Academic Committee of the Queen Sophia Center for the Study of Violence, as well as an advisor to the Center for Global Counterterrorism Cooperation in New York and to the Bangladesh Center for Terrorism Research. He belongs to the Terrorism Studies Program Board at the University of St. Andrews and as a chairman of the European Commission Expert Group on Violent Radicalization. Between 2004 and 2006, he served as a, uh, a term as Senior Advisor on, on Anti-Terrorist Policy to the Ministry of the Interior of the Government of uh, Spain. And presently, he is the Director of the Program on Counterterrorism, El Cano Royal Institute, Madrid, Spain. Professor Renatis. Thank you very much for your kind words. And first of all, allow me to thank uh, the IDC, the ICT, in the person of uh, Professor Boaz Ganor, also in the person of uh, Dr. Elie Carmon, um, for inviting me to this conference. It was a pleasure, by the way, to meet you and, and your colleagues at the El Cano. Royal Institute in Madrid last spring, and very much look forward to uh, fruitful cooperation in the future. My contribution to this panel will be uh, more specific, more focused than those the, uh, uh, excellent uh, interventions that you already had the opportunity to listen to. And let me start by something that um, uh, Roan Gunaratna reminded us this morning about. Uh, the epicenter of global terrorism today is in the uh, uh, Fatah area in Pakistan, and there are a number of countries which are um, uh, extremely affected by uh, uh, this terrorism. Uh, according to our data at the Cano, last July, this past July, so in 31 days, we had in Pakistan 130 terrorist attacks. The vast majority of them Islamist, jihadist in orientation. We had 120 in Iraq, uh, about 100 in Afghanistan, and 120 in India. We too, all too often forget about this particular case. So, there we have some countries where uh, terrorism, Al-Qaeda related one way or the other, terrorism is more than just a daily fact. Then we have other countries uh, where terrorism is very frequent, though no, not to those levels, but very frequent. For instance, in July, we had 30 terrorist attacks in Russia in Ingushetia, Chechnya, Dagestan, literally unnoticed in the, um, in the papers that we commonly read. We have 13 attacks uh, in July only in Algeria. Well, we can establish uh, a rank of frequencies. If we go down to the bottom and leave Latin America apart, then we have for instance, European countries where attacks uh, related to the current global tourism network are not a campaign per se, as it was uh, really pointed before, but just happen from time to time, despite the fact that a number of plots are uh, timely thwarted or disrupted every year. Looking at the phenomenon of 
terrorism, global terrorism in particular, from uh, those countries, the European countries I mean, looking at the phenomenon from below might help to validate or to refute some of the visions about global terrorism as a whole that we heard uh, or have been presented uh, uh, in this conference or will be presented in this conference. Allow me in this sense to look at this phenomenon from a national perspective, uh, the, a perspective from the country, from a country, Spain in this particular case, which is at the crossroads of the third wave of modern rebel terrorism and the fourth wave of modern rebel terrorism. If we are to use uh, the terms um, uh, um, uh, set forward by uh, Professor David Rappaport in a very well-known chapter. Uh, the experience of Spain might prove, um, or might, might prove insightful in um, understanding the threat and its evolution uh, that we face in Europe in particular nowadays. As from the Madrid bombings, uh, that I would say as from the year 2005, the threat of global terrorism, this threat terrorism directly or indirectly related to Al Qaeda, comes basically in my country from two different sources. First, independent local cells or individuals inspired by Al Qaeda, by Al Qaeda's propaganda, by Al Qaeda's actions, motivated primarily by conflicts in Iraq and secondarily in Afghanistan. And this is something affecting first generation immigrants. Um, the, 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 the variable the control here is time, not first or second generation. Secondly, the threat comes from Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, from cells and small groups linked to this organization. As you probably well know, Spain is an explicit target for Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, only second to France. Note that second and third generations are still not significant in the case of Spain or in the case of Italy as they are uh, in France, Belgium or the United Kingdom. Note also that those two sources of the threat have to be complemented with Al-Qaeda core, Al-Qaeda central and also with South Asian networks if we are to provide a full picture of global tourism threat sources in Western Europe. And I would like to also call your attention on the fact that this is not the picture of an amorphous threat, but of a polymorphous one. We have individual actors and collective actors. We have small groups and larger groups. We have loosely articulated cells and strongly organized movements. And also, I call your attention on the fact that the threat is not basically coming from independent local cells, self-constituted, self-radicalized, or composed by homegrown wannabes. And obviously, I'm sided with Bruce Hoffman in the dispute that Professor Gunnar was referring to before in this respect. Indeed, most of the cells dismantled in Spain over the past two years were related to or subordinated to Al Qaeda in the land of Islamic Maghreb. Initially, the press reported 
uh, local independent cells uh, with unknown connections to the research and the police investigation took sometimes more time than others, but uh, in the mass majority of cases, uh, uh, evidence about the linkages of those cells to Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. This organization is amalgamating, assembling together a good portion of radicalized individuals previously unaffiliated or previously affiliated to groups virtually extinct like the Moroccan Islamic combatant group in addition to individuals who in the past were loyal to the Salafist group for preaching and combat. It is true that those individuals and cells are mainly devoted to the mobilization of human and material resources to be transferred to Algeria. Uh, fundraising, uh, recruiting individuals uh, sent for adoctrination and training to Algeria, to northern Mali, also to Iraq. But interestingly, as from the spring 2007, as from that moment on, it is more common for individuals being recruited in Spain and other European countries, in southern European countries, to be recruited and sent to northern Africa than to Iraq, as it was previously the ordinary case. And of course, all these Harijin, all these individuals, uh, are by themselves a source of threat. They might come back from those camps, mobile camps in Northern Mali or just camps in uh, Algeria, or they might come back from fighting experiences in Iraq and be by themselves a source of threat. Support cells, however, logistical uh, supporting cells, financial cells, and so on, might, might under some circumstances, turn into planning attacks cells. Actually, this is one of the main lessons of, Madrid, of the Madrid bombings. Last July, this past July, there was a police operation in Spain in three cities across the Mediterranean coast. 18 individuals were arrested, 16 Algerians and two Moroccans. Um, and they were engaged in financing, they were engaged in recruitment. For the first time, we have now evidence of an Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb cell in Spain also preparing an attack inside the country. Therefore, the threat from global terrorism in Western Europe seems to be evolving in such a manner that major attacks would, in the short and middle term, more likely come from a combination of locally based cells and networks on the one hand and rather strong groups and organizations established abroad in North Africa, in the case of al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, or in the Fatah area in Pakistan. The combination, as some of the examples in Spain also show, is often facilitated by, let's call it that way, a network of jihadi veterans active all across Europe. The Madrid bombings were already a manifestation of this trend. In the Madrid bombings, contrary to uh, a, a generalized perception, which I don't really know where it comes from, in the Madrid bombings we have, yes, individuals belonging to a local cell, but we also have individuals belonging to the first Al-Qaeda cell established in the middle 90s by Abu Busa al-Suri in Spain. And then, and then we have leading members of the Moroccan Islamic combatant group, in addition to individuals who were in contact by phone with leading members of the Libyan Islamic combatant group, in addition to an important individual who was in the past, um, at least we know in the past was, member of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. 
But that's also a very interesting case. January 2008, Barcelona. We have individuals planning to perpetrate a major multiple suicide attack in the Barcelona underground system with at least three or four suicide bombers. There, in addition to individuals belonging to the local cell and those suiciders who came to Barcelona from different um, cities across Europe where they arrived from Pakistan, we have individuals related to Tariq et Taliban, Tariq et Taliban Pakistan, which was referred to this morning as well. And we have individuals, say, belonging to a local network radicalized in the Tariq Pensillat Mosque in Barcelona, where those to provide accommodation and uh, support and facilitate the operation. We, interestingly, we also have an individual linked to Lashkar et Tajiba. A few days after the Barcelona plot was thwarted and uh, uh, um, over a dozen of individuals arrested and all those are prosecuted formally. Baitullah Mesud appeared on Al Jazeera um, on a recorded interview expressing his intention to carry out terrorist operation in Europe against countries having troops in Afghanistan. So this kind of combination between domestic elements and transnational actors speaks by itself about the limitations faced by national counterterrorism strategies. We all know that. And highlights the need for effective international cooperation, basically bilateral at least when it comes to law enforcement and intelligence. And this is the case of Spain, for instance, with Algeria, with Pakistan, uh, with, with Morocco as well. And it's not always easy for Europeans to work in this new focus of global tourism uh, as Northern Africa is, uh, is becoming, since, as you know, uh, Algerian and Moroccan authorities uh, do not get along very well. And uh, and, and perhaps this is an opportunity for countries such as Spain or France to try to bring uh, the gap. And, and we, we strongly need um, Morocco into this. Uh, yeah, in Spain we know it not only because of the Madrid bombings, but just a very recent example, not to, not to take you far away from what is happening now. This past August, just a few weeks ago, a cell was dismantled in Morocco. The cell was named Fatah al-Andalus. Fifteen people arrested, all of them Moroccans. Uh, they were looking forward to perpetrate suicide attacks in Morocco against security forces, uh, two sides, and probably the United Nations mission in the Sahara. Now, those 15 individuals were not only closely in contact with Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb in Algeria, but also to Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb elements in Mauritania, in France, in Spain, and even contacts unrelated to Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, but related to uh, the current global network of terror in Saudi Arabia. Speaking about opportunities, uh, the fact that Al-Qaeda related terrorism is killing more Muslims than any other category of people has already been stressed here today should be instrumental in the struggle over legitimacy, over legitimation if you want to be more precise uh, which counter-terrorism always implies uh, for instance Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb's new tactics, introducing Al-Qaeda style attacks, multiple operations, suicide bombers, highly lethal. Well, those attacks are killing basically Algerians. It is true that uh, 
the emir of al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb is saying we are warning the population that to be there or here or next to those guys or, uh, or, or close to those others and in, in, in any event they apply the takfiri uh, words and behavior to um, Algerians um, describing them as uh, not being Muslims the fact that uh, the result is that the pattern of victimization uh, is prompting debate and criticism uh, within its own population of reference I don't see imams in southern Europe uh, taking benefit from this fact they are very cautious when when criticizing um, this terrorism they are timid uh, I think they are suffering from the spiral of, of silence which is something already new with respect to other uh, cases of terrorism, especially in the small congregations. Opportunities to win the legitimacy struggle vanish, however, when governments react with excesses, non-selective policing, um, so that state action tends to be counterproductive and, and even makes cooperation, international cooperation difficult. There, there was a recent court ruling in Slovakia against the decision to extradite an Algerian and al qaeda Islamic Maghreb member to Algeria on the basis of police mistreatment and disrespect for basic human rights. And if you go to Morocco, um, those who those who are close to you and talk to you uh, about people being arrested or well, they say well they are arrested but they disappear we don't know what's going on and so on and so forth all, all this is uh, in, in, in the short and middle term at least counterproductive my very last point I said before that Spain is at the crossroads of uh, the third and the fourth waves of modern rebel terrorism uh, we, 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 we face not only the threat of um, uh, Islamist jihadist uh, terrorism but also the threat of ETA um, a terrorist organization which killed already 900 individuals 900 persons since it was born in, uh, in the 60s um, ETA is basically uh, what remains from the third wave of modern rebel terrorism in Europe is weaker than before um, due to conflict regulations, societal reactions, police efficiency since the, since the late 80s and international cooperation. All these are still valid concepts when thinking about the fight against terrorism. But perhaps it is worth to remember with respect to the case of ETA that this terrorist organization emerged in the, in the most developed region and the wealthiest one in Spain and most of its constituency were middle classes and the members were middle classes individuals with uh, good education coming from rather well to do families and, and this fact is important to remember because all too often we are making um, in, 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 in terms of grand theory uh, the association between poverty, exclusion, marginalization and terrorism at best this can be uh, part of, of a middle range theory but not part of a generalization about uh, terrorism. Uh, by the way, do you know where ETA members used to radicalize? Um, when I wrote about ETA members, I never used the term violent radicalization, which probably was an invention of a European bureaucrat or something like that. Uh, it was, you know, something more humble, like socialization into violence or uh, terrorist recruitment and so on. But you know where they used to radicalize violently? Churches, 
um, associations where peer groups, teenagers used to gather, and prisons. There was no internet in those days. And what their motivations were, analytically speaking, rational, emotional, and identitarian. Nothing new under the sun. Um, and, and I have to introduce a final word because um, uh, one or two, one or two times uh, during the day, the case of Spain has been used as, as an example of how terrorism might produce policy changes. And, and it was I, I, I took uh, a term on leave from the university and was engaged with my government uh, between in the aftermath of the Madrid bombings until uh, May 2006 precisely to to work in the adaptation of our internal security system to the threat of international terrorism our anti-terrorist arrangements were very good in fighting ETA but not so good in fighting international terrorism you, you are already familiar with that so um, there's something I have to say on that matter because but the Madrid bombings did not change um, governmental policy in Spain. Withdrawing from Iraq, I, I'm, not too, I'm not going to bother you with particularities about domestic politics in Spain, but withdrawing from Iraq was formalizing the electoral program of the Socialist Party because 90% of the Spaniards were against the invasion and occupation of the country because they thought that was going to be counterproductive in terms of fighting terrorism. Whether you might think the Spaniards were um, right or wrong, the fact is that it would have been untenable for the Socialist Party not to comply with an electoral process. But I will agree with you that the Prime Minister took the decision not in a very fortunate manner. Only six weeks after the bombings, um, not warning allies on the decision and, and, and not willing to wait a United Nations resolution, which came shortly afterwards. But do let me remember you that the terrorists who perpetrated the Madrid bombings demanded the government of Spain not only to leave Iraq, but also to leave Afghanistan. And the Spaniards, Spanish political, uh, Spanish public opinion, contrary to what they thought about Iraq, were in favor of intervening in Afghanistan in terms of a global counterterrorism struggle. So the Spanish government took the decision to withdraw from Iraq at the same time that the number of Spanish troops in Afghanistan was duplicated. And if you read the last um, report of the U.S. Department of State, the 2008, it reads clearly that Spain has been among the most aggressive countries in persecuting global tourism individuals, actually. Over, over 400 individuals arrested over the past four years, 75% of them formally prosecuted and 60% formally convicted. Thank you very much.